Good morning, everybody. Class is almost ready to start. Uh, does everybody have a book? Make sure you get a book that has the uh, the slides, some of the slides that we're going to be talking about today, along with some of the documentation that we have from a model city, which is Lowell, from a model state, which is uh, Oregon. Not Oregon, you got to call it Oregon. Um, and so we're going to be covering. So anybody wants, well, before we start the class, if anybody wants to come take a peek at Rusty, Rusty is a, a fire escape that we took off in elementary school. Uh, just between the Christmas break, uh, a couple of years back, and we've been using it to, uh, the way you see it there is the way we found it, and uh, there's a lot of rust. The reason why we have it is that we use it to show just how much abuse a fire escape can take when uh, people don't pull permits, when people don't pull fire permits, when people, uh, when landscapers are doing our job. Uh, what happens to, to the old 75, uh, 75 year rule of uh, you know, uh, hide and seek? The way you fix a fire escape for 75 years is you paint it and you cock it and uh, see in five years later. Um, I'm also going to discuss how a lot of in, uh, architects and engineers are not making any money on this because uh, you know, they weren't getting called to, to look at these things. And um, we're also going to talk about uh, you know the old the opinion letter versus the uh, the actual letter, the opinion versus fact. So if, uh, as everybody sort of signs in and gets ready, I'll also mention that aside from this class, we also have been giving classes uh, at your uh, at your city hall. Uh, we do teach a free class, and uh, what that is is if you want to get a regional class of the cities that touch your city, we've done that. For example, in Lowell, we did it in Worcester, we did it in Medford. So if you have a group of guys that in neighboring cities that want to get together and discuss fire escapes, we do get together. We can do a 90-minute 90, 90 lunch, and you get credit for it. We can do a two to four hour class like we did in Lowell and in Lawrence and some other, I mean, uh, in uh, Worcester and Metro, where you can, if you stay for two hours, you get two credits, and if you stay for four hours, and some of those you invite uh, fire department in, some of those you invite, which is fire prevention, uh, some of those who invite local vendors, local architects, and local engineers. Because in those classes, we're more specific, we're more hands-on. And in some of those classes, when time allows, we'll actually do what's called a downtown walk-around, where after we learn something, let's go downtown, let's walk around one city block that has a bunch of these fire escapes, and let's find out what's right, what's wrong. Okay? We also have um, the ability, in case it's raining that day, we have a lot of these uh, uh, downtown walk-arounds already recorded. So if you go to uh, the website, nationalfirescapeassociation.org, all these classes, and this one is going to get recorded also. So in case you have people in your office that didn't show up today, you can actually show them this class in about two or three weeks. It will be uploaded to, the, to that site. All our previous classes are on there also. So you're going to be able to sort of see classes. We did it at the MBCIA. We did it, uh, was it Bowen? Way out there in uh, Western Mass. Uh, we did Sambo. This is probably our third to fifth class. How many people have been to this class before? Wow, repeat customers. My karaoke show starts in about 45 minutes. Um, the, uh, so a lot of this is, uh, the greatest thing that we'll bring into you today is uh, we use Lowell as a model city to show what documentation would look like if you use some of the industry standard documentation that we actually have to make up that didn't exist. Uh, one of our greatest accomplishments is on the same documentation that we stuck in your book this year, we also have the state of Oregon. And they actually spent five years working hand in hand with us, and they actually basically uh, uh, changed their state code to reflect some great ideas like tags on your fire escape, which started up in Seattle with us. And they, they adopted, they made it that all fire escapes in this city must have a tag. I'm going to show you what a tag looks like. It's on the, it's on the back of your uh, thing. As a matter of fact, I'm going to grab a book and let's just... As we go through, um, as we go through, I'm going to show you what we're going to be talking about. It was one of our classes. It was one of our classes that we taught, I believe, in, in uh, Westboro, that a state inspector said that one of the things you guys were looking for was in departmental procedures and guidelines. So we created one. We send it to you as either a Word document or a PDF. You can do anything you want to it. You can even just steal the wording and drop it on your own letterhead if you want. Or 
the, the National Firescape Association, Katie, will work with you guys and she'll, uh, she'll put your information like we did here below. This tells you how an architect and an engineer should behave. That's what inspections are about. It's generalized. It mentions nobody by name. If a vendor is going to pull a permit in your city, it says that the vendor has certain rules he's got to follow, including the fact that he's got to walk in there with this engineer's report telling him what to do. And if he thinks he's going to paint that thing, he, uh, uh, the EPA says that it's got lead if it's older than 78. How many people here think they have firescapes older than 78 in their city? That's pretty much all the firescapes in the, in, the, in the U.S. are older than 78. They're all built in the 1900s, some 1930s. And they'll tell you about the EPA guidelines, you know, and how to properly handle the, the, the lead paint. Um, we're also going to, we haven't even done it in this class yet, but, you know, OSHA totally disagrees with the EPA on how you handle lead. Uh, so that's, some, that's for another class. What we have here is the confidence test. This confidence test is the same test you can pull if you go to seattle.org and they brought me out there to do the same class because three guys almost fell to their death from the fourth floor fire escape that was lag screwed to the wooden building. We helped them to, uh, basically not get opinion letters anymore from architects and engineers but get facts. So if you want an opinion, it's the old certification method. So if you want a fact, they have to answer yes, no questions about is there any rust in the internal connections. Well, if you read all this, otherwise you can just go right to uh, seattle.org, go to fire prevention, and they have all kinds of tests there. One of them is a confidence test. So all we did, this is the test we helped them build. You can download it in Word or PDF, or you can call Katie and she'll help you. She'll send you the file and you just need to put your name or she'll put it up there for you. She'll put your seal up there. She'll put, uh, you can guys, since this is a model city, to, to save a little time, if you guys want to see what Bob Marsilia did regarding his legal department, you know, you may save yourself some time. Everybody says they got to go through legal. Again, this is just an industry standard documentation. This is not a state documentation. I'll show you a state documentation in a minute. We're going to cover it in a bit. This is some example of what today's technology allows. You guys don't have to go see a rotten fire escape. Make your architect, your engineer, or your fire escape inspector bring you pictures of the horror. Okay? This is a document that we found online. This is a state document. And it's a preliminary and final affidavit for anything commercial over 35,000 cubic. We did nothing to the document other than add the blurb about 1,001.3. That's all we did. So now whenever you have any uh, commercial building, it's already over 35,000. It already uh, makes you have an architect or an engineer involved before the vendor gets his, gets his non-permitted hands on the fire escape. So you're going to get some control. So if you look at this and you look at the final, this is some of the things to stop what's been happening in the past 75 years and that this fire escapes have been handled by people who are just painting it. You need a permit to paint? No. So that's why for 75 years we've been painting fire escapes and hiding the connections with silicone. But the average life of a fire escape, you should, uh, you should be able to see that fire escape uh, in 25 to 50 years of its life, it should have all its bolts changed. So when you look at a fire escape like this in your city, you see original square head bolts. It's already 25 years beyond the useful life of a bolt. And the only way to confirm that bolt is good is a load test. This class is not about load testing. I'm going to show you load testing. This is not to force load testing. This is to force the fact that what should be done on these fire escapes is if, you're, if, you're, if the person who owns a building in your city spot repairs this, you will force a load test because all three codes concur on the load test as the final answer to the assurance that everybody wants. But if they change every bolt, you've got a certification in lieu of a load test. And any engineer that walks, or an architect that walks up to one of these fire escapes that every single fastener has been changed out, and the connections into the building have been verified or duplicated, he will gladly sign one of these documentations because there's no risk. Although risk is minimum because he's basically done what the law says. The authority having jurisdiction shall accept by load test or other evidence of strength. So what is a certification? It's other evidence of strength. So it's his job to convince you not to load test this thing. Okay? So this is some uh, uh, documentation that we, uh, we're going to cover today. Repair procedures and guidelines. It's very difficult. It says take the rust out of the connection and then when you close it again, seal it with some sort of uh, silicone or some rubber gasket. That's the extent of the repair guidelines. That's it. Take the rust out. Do not keep the rust in. If you look at this fire escape, 
which was on an elementary school, I got welds and the rust were never taken out. They just kept welding and welding and welding. And as rust grows, it keeps snapping every weld. So weld, snap, bolt, stretch. We have a Boston affidavit. For the longest time, the only affidavit you could ever get is a Boston certificate as a model for yourself. And it has a great line in here that architects and engineers love. To the best of my knowledge, information, and belief, these egress components uh, are in conformity with the provisions of the Mass Building Code and, uh, and certified to their structural adequacy and safety. Is that a fact letter or an opinion letter? Now, that opinion letter, believe it or not, 50 years ago was great because these things could handle anything when they were 25 years old. 50, you know, when they turned 50, to a certain degree, a lot of them would pass, a, you know, the, the, the bullet test. Well, Grandma is 75 years old today, needs a hip replacement. She's on life support, and she's dropping tenants, kids, and firemen. So, I'll be very quick here. So that's the only document that a lot of cities copy. They use the Boston certificate. And by the way, just to help generate some money, you see the fee? Boston charges 50 bucks. Uh, Cambridge charges 100 bucks. So there's a filing fee to basically issue this every five years. So if you're looking at an income generator, speak with those various cities as to whether or not you can charge a filing fee to receive this documentation. Documentation on all the components, Farscapes were basically built, the majority of all the Farscapes in the U.S. built between 1900 and 1930, until the code says no, no new Farscapes. All new construction, two staircases inside and an elevator if needed. No more Farscapes on the outside. Now what happened to the rest of the buildings? The rest of the buildings, they said, you know, we just got to keep maintaining them until we knock these buildings down because these buildings in the next 50 years are going to be gone. But somewhere in that 50 years, they invented duct tape, bubble gum, paper clips, and what else? Extension cords. <laughs> and they've kept these buildings alive. So now these fire escapes are, have hit 75 years, which nobody thought they would. And how many mansions in your city, how many big buildings in your city got converted into apartments? And the only answer is not another staircase inside. There's just no room for it. What was the answer? Fire escapes. When you've exhausted all means of putting the fire escape, I mean the staircase inside, what are you forced to accept? Fire escapes. So there's drawings. These are drawings showing you know typical solutions to mansions, to uh, big buildings, big factories. And what's the answer? The last thing that we're going to be talking about is going to be tags. So Seattle demands all the fire escapes in this city have a, they have a white tag. If the fire escape is being repaired, it needs a yellow tag. If the fire escape is not uh, functional, it needs a red tag. Portland's doing the same thing, but they put it into their code. Okay? So this is some of the recommendations that we make, because imagine, uh, for the, who's this going to benefit first? It's the fireman. In the middle of the night, crawling down a back alley, he jumps and gets on a fire escape. Any firemen here? No? You know the rule that all the firemen tell each other, the old guys tell the new guys, in case of fire, don't use the... Right? Imagine that. You think you get that word out on Channel 5? That people, by the way, if you have a fire escape, don't ever use it. We, don't, we, we, we would never use it. So don't you use it. <coughs> Most states, 40 out of 50 states, fire departments control all the inspection of these fire escapes. 10 out of uh, 50 states, it's a building department. This is one of those states that the code, is, it falls on you guys to maintain this code. Now the reason why we have this code and we have the five year rule is that on that photograph that you guys saw outside of the person falling over there on Marble Street, that happened in 72 or 73, and the code at that time stated to, you must maintain your fire escape at all times. Then that fireman almost died, the woman died, the, the, the child landed on her from the fourth story, and what did they change? They added in Massachusetts the five year rule to it. Okay? But the tags, are great in that uh, both the tenant, the fireman, and everybody knows, just like an elevator, when you walk in an elevator, you see the tag, which now they're, hot. they're putting in the manager's office, but why, what, when you look at a sprinkler, what do they have? It's an automatic point that says things are, things are good. There's a tag. On an extinguisher, what do you have? A tag. What don't you have on a fire escape? It's a guessing game. You never know when the last time it got certified. Well, with these tags, seven to ten feet off the ground, I'm going to show you what they look like, Everybody knows, the building inspector knows, the fireman knows, the owner knows, the tenant knows that the fire escape is what? Certified and who's certified and when they're gonna and when the next certification date is due. Okay? So as we get to different parts, that's what this book is gonna cover. I'm gonna get Kate to uh, start pushing buttons very shortly.
Uh, does anybody have any questions just to, before I start going into some of the slides? This is only a 90 minute class. I'm going to like, I'm going to just fly through a few slides and then end so that we can just talk about Rusty and what can you do in your city. You know what I'm saying? So, does anybody have any questions now to begin with? It's a quiet crowd. It's a quiet crowd. Yes, go ahead. Why doesn't Massachusetts just uh, do like the elevators and have, have certification for the elevators? Like the elevators. They, there is, it's a five year rule. You have to certify for right, five years. There, there is, but there's no, there's no system to do it. There's a law, but there's no system. There is a system. The system says you must hire, it says right in the code. Uh, fire schemes must be inspected every five years. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, just to open up uh, the iceberg for you guys. Ready? I'll read your code. All exterior bridges. Have I mentioned firescapes yet? Steel or wooden stairways. Have I mentioned this yet? Fire escapes and egress balconies. Now that I mentioned fire escapes, so this is just the tip of the iceberg, but everything you have outside in your building, porches, decks, they all fall under this. <clears throat> this is just the tip of the iceberg that I'm talking about, guys. The code was not written for fire escapes. The, the code was written for all exterior steel or wooden stairways. So I'm just going to talk about fire escapes today. But this is where you're going to start, but then you're going to grow back into a lot of these rotten 75-year-old wooden porches on the back of a lot of your a lot of your buildings. A lot of these wood decks that are on the back of your buildings. What are they what are they supposed to have? Five-year inspection. It's right there in the code. Um, and they should be certified, examined or tested, and or tested, and certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years by a mass registered professional engineer or others qualified and acceptable to the building official who, let, who shall then submit an affidavit to the building official. So there is a mechanism here. Not really. That's, <laughs> that's pretty general. I mean, so I can get someone off the street and say, okay, you know, uh, you certify that fire escape. But there's no definitive report. The affidavit, there's no form of affidavit by the state. None of that. I know from the state, you're right. But there is. In other words, there's no guidance from the state as to. And that's why we're having this class. To, to well, basically change that. We'd love to change it. If you know anybody on the state level, if you know anybody that. He's <laughs> not laughing, I don't know why. But uh, we're here to say that here's what's happening nationwide. If you guys have, if anybody here has connections, anybody here is sitting on a board, anybody knows how we can get this to come from the top down. As a matter of fact, I spoke with Dan of the Federation and I asked them to basically get together. Because we've taught all three classes, all three associations, the same class. This is probably my third or fourth time here that somebody has seen me doing this class. Um, where we want to create a committee to basically present from the Federation something that is going to be Massachusetts accepted. Whether it's, whether it's from the Federation only or from the state, I only know what I know and I don't have all the connections in the world, but there's plenty of people that know people that understand that this is a concern because grandma is 75 years old. You can't jump on her back anymore. So we'll get, we'll get to there. You want to flip the next slide? Um, but that's what, what the class is all about here. We're going to basically uh, set the tone to say who can help, who wants to help, who can do something about it. Let's, let's just do it. I've just been doing this uh, as I'm in, the, I'm in the iron business. I got hijacked into this when I was 11 years old. So I've been at this for 40 years. I've seen all the abuse. So um, the class is, uh, uh, again, as I mentioned before, this is a, only a 90 minute class. So I'm going to be making her figure go nice. But nice and fast and forward. Go ahead, next one. Actually, um, I'll go, I, I was just going to talk about that. Can you go back one? It's, it's the same thing as reverse. Guys, live load test, right? Let it fill out. And I then, think it loads the whole thing. Yeah. This, um, <coughs> the live load test is basically when the firemen get on it. You, you either live or they die. But see this right here? This is a pretty old picture. But look how many firemen are sitting on that. The rule is 100 pounds per square foot. Let's take a look at that top platform. Is that a four by four? That's 16 square feet times 100 pounds. That, that can hold 1,600 pounds. You got all these firemen up there. You got probably four firemen up there, each weighing 300 pounds because it's a 200 pound fireman with 100 pounds of gear. Can they all fit on there anyway? Can you fit four guys on a four by four? So it's, it's overbuilt anyway. But look at it. They feel safe because that fire escape is made beyond whatever they can pile on there. Okay. So, and if you had just people, 150 pound per, uh, people, you couldn't get five or 10 people on there. It's 
Because 10 people will equal 1,500 pounds of gross weight. This thing is made for 1,600 pounds on that 4x4. Four, four four. Okay, next slide. So I just want to show you, but this is the live load test. This is when firemen fall, and that's the photograph that we showed you. Basically, what saved that fireman is he grabbed the ladder with one hand. And as the woman tried to grab him by the knees, she couldn't hold on. She fell to her death. Her knees landed on her. But she died because of all the pieces of the fire escape following her basically crushed her. It was a four-story fall. The billing code. We teach code all over the United States. We teach either the International Fire Code, which is pr primarily 40 states. And we teach also NFPA, which is also done in uh, Rhode Island, up in, in uh, New Hampshire. And we teach the International Building Code. Let's say what they all say regarding fire escapes. And they have one paragraph. You go looking for this stuff, you got one paragraph regarding maintenance. And no more information. That's it. It says, um, let's use the NFPA to start. It says, the, it says it the best. The authority having jurisdiction shall be permitted to approve any existing fire escape that has been shown by load test or other satisfactory evidence to have adequate, adequate strength. Let's take a look at your code. Testing, certification, all exterior fire escape systems shall be examined and or tested, uh, and we call that spot repaired and then load tested, and or certified for structural adequacy and safety. And that means if you're gonna, if you're gonna be certifying it, you're trying to avoid the load test, okay? And then let's take a look at the International Fire Code. Testing and certification. Any fire escape system found in a state of deterioration or unsafe uh, shall be repaired immediately. Depending on the structural condition, the load test shall be conducted. Who has the authority to order a load test? Is it the architect, the engineer, or the authority having jurisdiction? So if you're not satisfied, and you've got some engineer that is just, you know, wants to throw an opinion letter in your face, and you're concerned about the fire escape that was just looks like it just got a paint job and some caulking, can you, or the three people involved, can you and the fire marshal order a load test? Can you accept the certification and then have the fire marshal come in and say, I want a load test, based on what the code says? Can the fire marshal accept it and can have the building inspector say, I'm not, I'm not satisfied, I want a load test? All three codes concur. Anybody disagree? All we're going to talk about today is certification. We're not going to force load tests. We're going to show you load tests. This is not to make people do load tests. But we're, our, our, the national model states that if you spot repair that, then you're only getting spot assurances. What about the rest of the stuff? Well, you load test the rest of that stuff, what do you get? You get the assurance, right? Two things the, the codes let me do. I can load test it or other evidence of strength. So if I spot repair it, what are you going to throw at me if I walk into your city? How are you going to sleep well at night with 100% assurance? Low tested. So it, it says right in the code and you're, and you're backed up. But if all of a sudden I go out of my way, I say, no, no. Every bolt is out and new. No rust in any connections and I can prove it. And the unknown into the building, I did one of two things. I verified that they were in good condition or I duplicated them with a brand new either epoxy or a new through bolt because I didn't want to touch the building at all. I didn't want to touch that crumbly wall. I basically let sleeping dogs lie and I made a new connection. And have I satisfied you with other evidence of strength? Can you still jam a load test down my throat? Even though I've given you other, other evidence of strength? Sure you can. <laughs> you can still order a load test. But I'm trying, to, I'm trying to save money because a load test is dragging bags around, doing all kinds of things, and does that buy any pain? Does it buy any bolts? Uh, so this is what we're going to be talking about today, and that's what the, the, some of the documents you have in front of you are all about. Now, here's in uh, uh, Bridgeport. Did it again? But right now, firefighters are taking down the ladders and rolling up the hoses. But earlier in the night when they pulled up, there were flames coming out of the side of the building. Firefighters say it was one of the scarier moments, because when you pull up to a building and you see children, and mothers hanging off the side of the fire escape, smoke swirling around them. They said, that's scary, scary stuff. They got up there, they got the ladders up, and they said nobody got hurt. The uh, fire escape, there was uh, three or four people hanging off the fire escape. They couldn't get off. They were just on the fire escapes. I had people hanging in the fire escapes at the rear of the building, and on this side of the building, they, we had a bunch of people on that fire escape. Well, about 50 people were displaced inside this building. I'm out of fire, fire escape. There's good news tonight. It looks like everybody will be allowed to go back in, except the one unit where the fire was in. They said, that's good luck to them tonight. I'm Bob Wilson, on the scene of Bridgeport, News 8.
So when they got there, firefighting or fire or fire rescue? What what happens in the first three to five minutes? Who dies in the first three to five minutes? Everybody that's inhaling smoke, right? Fire doesn't kill you. Smoke kills you. So they shot. They get there. They're supposed to be fighting fires, but what are they doing? We got 50 people on a complex. How many of you guys have uh, apartment complexes like that that have fire escapes? That means a regress wrapping all around. And they and why couldn't they get down by themselves? Because all the ladders were frozen and shut. So this became a fire rescue. So the the fire the fire was going, and what was every single fireman dealing with? Getting people off the fire escape, which meant doing what? Going to get the ladders and doing what? Putting them on the fire escape, getting these people down. How about that little girl? She was only eight years old. How many times have you trained your little girl to come climb down a ladder from the second or third floor by herself? And then she's about uh, you know ten feet off the ground because the ladder is not coming down by itself. Uh, she's going to jump. Yes, yeah, good. You know, the one thing that you know we're talking about this, and I, I kind of agree with this guy here, but just in this thing here, it was so bad. This is so bad. This whole thing. They let him move back into the building that night, and the guy just said that. We, you, Six you months later, I examined the responsibility for the building owners. At some point, I mean, we throw all this on the building official. I've got it. The building inspector official do this and that. I can tell you, some of the places I've worked, to, to, to do real enforcement on this and follow through, probably nine, ten hours of, of between of enforcement, letters, court, all that per unit. If you've got 10,000 units, how are you going to do it? I, I wish I was going to bring you the answer. I'm just trying to handle some of the pieces, one case at a time, and that is, let's do it. Let's, let's get you guys with something in your hands that you can use to make sure that the fire schemes that are getting signed off are properly getting signed off and you're not getting the what's called a fly-by drive-by by certain people who are basically giving you an opinion letter to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief. Yes? Have you talked to like Tom Gatsunitz or, or Rob Anderson in the state and said, we have a set of policies and procedures and we'd like you to adopt it statewide and have it part of the state building code or at least part of the general law one way or the other? I'll answer with the next video. Okay, click the next video. The answer is yes. We've, we've been sending out letters, but things move slow from the top down. We have more uh, we have more activity going on on the grassroots level than we have from the top down. So, uh, but we have put our name out there. We have asked. Black faces. Paul and a firefighter's line of duty. But Chief William Hitchcock remembers the night. It wasn't the fire that almost stopped him. Of course. But the fire escape that broke underneath him. Away from the building. And our investigation found across Massachusetts more unsafe fire escapes. Rusty, deteriorating, crumbling, broken. And what state officials didn't know, the system they set up to keep fire escapes safe is also falling apart. The potential ramifications are disastrous. So let's look at this one. This expert iron ore is like My evil twin brother. Maintains and inspect fire escapes. So that over here, for months, we examined dozens of them with alarming results. Looking at this today, would this pass inspection? No. In dormitories, at theaters, at homes, at apartment buildings. Rust is actually eating away the metal of the right. fire escape. Right. And the bottom line? It'll get weak and then measure a fall. This one has rotted connections. This is missing bolts, twisted metal. Would the stairs come down? No, never come down. This one, a broken tread. So how dangerous is it for the people inside this building? This fire escape is definitely going to put somebody either in the hospital or going to put somebody in the, in the cemetery. Fire escapes are so critical. The state building code requires they be certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years. But our investigation found that safeguard is simply being ignored. Here's proof. We chose fire escapes at random in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Worcester, and here in Quincy. We checked building department files, but there's no fire escape certification. To see if building owners had submitted their mandatory inspection reports. There's no certification in this one Bottom line, not one we checked in Quincy had been certified as safe. And the director of inspectional services admitted because of staffing shortages, the city has no idea how many other fire escape owners are breaking the rules. And as a result, do you know how many fire escapes in your city are safe or not? Well, I don't know. In Worcester, not one we checked was certified. In Somerville, no. four more fire escapes. Two false the facts. Yeah. Not one up-to-date certification. And again, no system for keeping track. How can they get away? 
I guess the, the shortest answer of all is because we don't have the resources to sit here and follow up on these things. If structural deficiencies are reported, local building inspectors can actually evacuate residents until repairs are made. Could you talk to us on camera about this? No. But when we surveyed two dozen more communities, most admitted they had no idea how many fire escapes were certified. In Taunton, inspectors told us they haven't seen a certification in 25 years. Northampton officials said, it's a cold day in hell when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> The official charge would not come out to discuss it. In Boston, there are more than 8,000 fire escapes. Again, according to inspectional services, not one wheat chef was certified. Officials know they are required to enforce the building code, but they admit they don't always know if owners are breaking the law. The building code is being ignored. Right, but it's difficult to write a violation you don't have knowledge of something like that. But state officials say for a critical issue like this, communities should know. And they warn the Massachusetts building code is not optional. Does it worry you that these fire escapes are not being certified? This is an important issue and should not be ignored. That's because after the smoke and flames begin, It'll be too late to learn. You've got no way out. I can't stress it enough, Hank, that these things have to be maintained and, and someone's got to be watching. As a result of our investigation, state officials will now issue an alert to local inspectors. Meanwhile, if there's a fire escape on your home or office, you can contact your local building department to make sure it's properly certified. In the newsroom, I'm Hank Philippi Ryan. I hope that answered your question. So uh, this was done in 2003, by the way. How many years have uh, we been at this? So if, if, what I'm saying to anybody, if I'll go with anybody here that wants to walk me into any office, into any official, into any organization, to anywhere. It's, you know, aside from uh, doing this, and this is all voluntary, by the way, we don't charge to do a lot of these classes. Um, if you know someone, can do something, want to help promote, Let's, let's get together because a lot of times that's my biggest issue is that the door won't even, I'll knock when nobody opens it, yes. Did you talk to Tom get some this yesterday? He was here. I know. Spoke uh, at, as, at as a matter of fact, just to prove that I did speak with him, when I was speaking with Kay, I said, is it with a G or with a K? We were trying to find him. Uh, so that's one of the persons I went to. I said, listen, we got to speak with that guy. We also spoke with the Dan of the Federation. We also spoke with uh, Dorothy of the ICC for us to go to and teach a class down in uh, Atlantic City. So we do get out, and we teach from Seattle to San Diego, Chicago to Texas, from Maine to Florida. Guess what we don't get? We don't get a lot of, we get uh, statewide, I mean I teach the entire state of New Jersey through Kane University. They actually pay me for a six hour class for continuing ed. But the state has never called me once. The state here has never called me once. But what I'm telling you, it's not that I want somebody to call me or I can go and knock on the door. If anybody here has the key to the front door or the back door of any official, just call me. I'd be more than happy to go there and I'll just talk about the book and what we've done already for 10 years. This is a broken system. I just need your assistance. And I've got a lot more activity happening on a grassroots level. That's why we have a model city like Lowell that took the broken city and didn't wait for the state to come in and say they basically started going. That's why I gave you documentation that shows you're not only a state model, I mean a city model, I showed you a state model. So Oregon, it took me five years for Oregon to finally go, get through all the molasses. It doesn't, mean that, it doesn't mean that this is not more important than anything else. It just means that there's a lot of things ahead of me. And this is the bastard child of egress. It wasn't supposed to be here. It wasn't here 25 years ago, it wasn't here 50 years ago. But grandma's 75 years old. Guess what she's doing right now? She can't handle the grandkids jumping on her back. So guess what uh, Boston did? Let me tell you a couple of tricks. Boston automatically made, do you? And this, you, everybody should write this down. In your city, anybody pulls a permit, to close the permit, you need a current certificate. That's how Boston dealt with it, so that now you put an electrical permit, a plumbing permit, any kind of permit. To close the permit, you need a current certification. So that's one way they got back into it. Aside from any other aggressive modes of, of, of enforcement, that was one of them. So, the second thing, get your fire prevention to deal with it. When they basically do a housing inspection, when they do a smoke detector inspection, on their checklist should be, uh, I'm about to okay your smokes, but I need a copy of the certificate. They're not enforcing the, the, the examination, they're asking for a copy that you already have. If they don't, they can still issue the smoke, but now there's a violation that's coming because they're gonna interconnect inter 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 with you guys 
and make you guys. So there's the check. Permits and smoke detectors. I was also told by a building official that the health inspector now is a big key to this because a lot of, uh, of people are doing uh, apartment re-rentals, right? You guys, have, uh, is that, that's not always enforced in a lot of cities, but when you re-rent your apartment, you're supposed to have a health inspection go through? Anybody? Go ahead. Sometimes you have the health inspector requirement, but a lot of the health inspectors don't necessarily know about it, um, about your requirement. I'm sort of, I cross the line between health inspector and building, and I Would you like to come up here and speak, or you can <laughs> speak loud enough so that everybody can hear you? So what I is that rule about? That, about but we're working on the public health side to train the people who are doing the housing inspections now about these five-year certificates. But the issue is that we don't have any jurisdiction for enforcement on, on the public health side. So it goes back over to building who's understaffed. So but you do write the violation. What? You write the violation. We they enforce the it. And then we refer to building. But building can't necessarily do it because they're understaffed. They, 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 don't, they don't have the resources needed to do it. Yet. So we're, we're working. They're common theme for all of this, all the videos and everything. Perfect. So we're working with now with the health inspectors now to basically make them aware that they'll cite the condition, it's going to come back to building, who then enforces it within 30 days or whatever the situation may be. But like he says, health departments are on the staff, building departments are on the staff, we're just bringing the condition out to you guys. But by using a trigger, any building permits getting pulled, put the requirement to close the permit, not issue a permit, to close the permit, I need a copy of the current certification on your means of egress if it's external. Um, the fire prevention, if they're signing off on a smoke, they also need a copy to basically sign off there. There's two people now watching every building as it comes up to play. The, the health guys are starting to get into this, so these are some ideas. Because uh, what we're trying to avoid is just what happened here. And every, the five-year rule is very important. Otherwise, what's going to happen is, when just when you thought it was safe, uh, you can do the next slide, and the next slide. So here's some uh, load tests that actually didn't go very well. And we're going to go quickly through this. This is in, uh, oh, hold on. <laughs> in Boston, a girl fell five, five, feet, uh, five stories to her death in Beacon Hill. She basically was at the very top. There was no railing there. She was uh, basically, one building was using another building's rooftop for pleasure at night, uh, you know, hanging out on the deck. The phone rang. She went back. She didn't live in the apartment. She went back. She fell to the side. She landed in the pit down here. Next slide. These are done, I think this is done in Blackstone, I believe. This was a, uh, a guy who, who carved these buildings out into condos. Him and his son did the roof themselves. They lifted the fire escape up, did the roof, put the fire escape back down. Had a bunch of bolts left over like most mechanics. And what did they do with those bolts? Never needed it anyway. They should have. Uh, so this fire escape basically fell. There was five people on it. A buyer, a seller, the, the, real, the two real estate agents plus a condo uh, person, and they all fell 12 feet to the ground. Not to the ground, they only fell 12 feet. When we got there, all the fire escapes were ready to fall off the building. Okay, lawsuits, this happens. Next one. Iowa, we're involved in a case where expert witnesses where three kids are watching fireworks. This is one of those typical houses similar to uh, Austin where you put how many kids in, in, uh, in a typical house like this 19. for the university? 19. 19, correct, not 18, 8. You got to go to 19 because that's the correct number now. And these three kids fell from there because the fire escape, basically the, the, some of the guys fixing the, uh, the building needed the fire escape out of the way to finish the vinyl. So they took the through bolts out. Took the fire escape down, finished the vinyl, put the fire escape back, put black screws back in the holes that used to be a through bolt hole. And the kids got up there and basically this thing fell to the ground. That's the blood on the ground and this is a lawsuit. And then they took the evidence, they took this fire escape and they threw it in a field to properly secure, you know, this is a fire escape CSI. They threw it in, a, in, a, in an empty lot about eight that the guy owned. So we, you know, we were conserving evidence in an empty field. As we were walking through the empty field, there's the photograph of the, the, the latch screw still in the, the, the bracket that was holding it up. Next shot. This is us walking around, and we found the piece. Now there's lawyers, <laughs> there's inspectors, and here we are in an open field walking around, because that's what they did. The guy opened, owned this lot. So. Next photograph. They put it back, through bolted it, and put a leg on it, and they were so unsure of themselves that they put it back, through bolted it and gave it a leg. The leg on the roof was right on the asphalt shingle. There was no footing there. <laughs> Next, this is Iowa, so live load testing. What do we got? These are older shots, guys. 
but they're great to show what? Just what, what happens every day on fire escapes. Now, the, this is typical, the last one over there was typical of stuff that happens down in, in Cambridge. And I, uh, one of, we got a call one time that on a Cambridge building similar to that kind, of, it's not the photograph, but they do that to watch the parades. There was a cast iron molding top that they were leaning on and it pushed off and that projectile came down and there was people sitting down below on the stair and it just missed them. And it careened. But that basically, that thing was coming down like a javelin and, was, and so, but the old days, no AC, uh, firemen, this is, you know, firemen's worst nightmare. Every now and then, firemen are grabbing people through the fire escape because for whatever reason, you can't get through the front door. You know what I'm saying? But firemen and children get hurt on these fire escapes because the treads drop out. That one up there, we have a gentleman in Chicago that we work with. His dad died about seven years ago fixing a fire escape just like that. You know, because it's domino. You're fixing this, you're fixing that. And what happened? He fell seven stories. So it affects everybody. Even the guys who are trying to fix the fire escapes, they, it's a... It's basically a, a, a crapshoot. So, um, in in a place we have a lot of the universities and dormit uh, dormitories, what happens? What's the fire escape? Can't smoke in the building. Where do you smoke? If you're going to your, your if you're going upstairs to visit your friend, you go through the main stair or you go through the back stair. How about wedding shots? How about burning candles and you know and studying out, out on the fire escape? Next shot. All right, let's take, a, let's take a look at who inspects fire escapes. The code's very clear. Registered professional or others acceptable to the building official. So if you click, engineers. Any engineer. They should have to be a registered PE. So a nice construction engineer can sign, uh, has to sign up for this. He'll be an engineer. Next, architects. In most states, architects are mentioned. So it's uh, registered architects and engineers. In some other states, like this one, it's others acceptable to the building official. So if you don't accept an architect, he has to get verbal approval from you that you accept that architect. Next one, city officials. I get many people tell me that you guys already inspected the fire escape. There's nothing wrong with it. I said, no, no city officials inspect fire escapes. They write violations on things they see on fire escapes, but they don't inspect fire escapes. Next, fire escape inspectors. Well, the only two uh, licenses available out there to inspect a fire escape is a G3 license out of Boston, so if you're in Boston and you fix fire escapes and you have a G3 license which lets you repair, uh, you know, do window guards, railings, and little by I beams, and you fix fire escapes, guess what they let you sign off on? The fire escape. So probably no abuse there, right? The second license is out of California. It's a Reg 4 license, a thousand questions, a thousand dollars. You have to get at least an 80, uh, but it's issued by the fire prevention uh, by the fire department, and that's a three-year license. And they have a whole system of the rank four, and it's a proper certification. You're a certified fire escape assemblies inspector. I have that license. And in Boston, I have the G3 license. But the abuse that's going on in the Boston licenses, a lot of cities outside of Boston are not taking the G3 license, guys. Because here's the big, the big thing about the past 75 years using that license. Do I need a permit to, to paint your fire escape? And if I'm changing a couple of bolts on your fire escape, because how many of these guys who are painting the fire escape are changing every bolt? How many? Not really. So I'm painting the fire escape. I'm changing a few bolts. You catch me in the act. What do I tell you I'm doing? I'm painting the fire escape. At the end, there's a document that shows up, and it's usually a Boston certificate with the name taken off the top, and your city name can be put on the top, and the G3 guy signs it. Now, 20, you know, 50 years ago, that wasn't an issue because these things were bulletproof. 25 years ago, this wasn't really an issue because they, they were still semi-bulletproof. But what's happening now? And for those 50 years, guess who never got a dime, really? Especially in the Boston and surrounding area. Architects and engineers. Why? <coughs> because what did they, the, these guys that inspected the fire escapes, they started turning estimates into free inspections. And then they would just basically, you know, play hide and seek. It's, you paint it and you hide, you hide the repair. Now, did they always get a, an engineer to sign off at the end? No. That's the abuse. We're trying to say to you, that's one of the things that needs to happen with grandma now. We need to get uh, grandma in with that. Anything, first of all, anything commercial in your city already starts with the initial uh, affidavit, right? Preliminary affidavit, which I showed you in the book right here. It's a state document. We've done nothing to alter it other than put the code. We, sque we squeeze the code, the mass building code, into it, right? 
So you can download this yourself right off the internet. You can ask Katie to make one up for you, and she'll put your seal up there, your information. All we did was just enter the mass building code. The rest of it is a state document. It's a preliminary uh, affidavit that you would use for everything else on a building that's commercial. So just commercially, you're going to be enforcing getting the engineers back on track or the architects, whichever one you approve. The preliminary affidavit and the final affidavit. And what do they ask for in here? Who the vendor is and his license number and the permit number. So that means who's watching Farscape from now on? You guys or the uh, registered professional? The quiet crowd. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, next. All right, I'm going to show you some things that we've done nationwide. Opinion versus low test versus certified. Guys. The reason why, I'm not here to say that architects and engineers don't know as much. Believe me, they know a lot more than all of us put together. And there is no certification program yet for the inspector side of things. And one of the reasons why I launched the National Firescape Association, which is still in its infancy, guys. It's got no money. It's got a lot of passion. That's all it's got. It's still in its infancy. We're still, we're still building this. But in the next three to five years, can we certify uh, Firescape inspectors and issue a, 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 a an acceptable certification that the state accepts? Yes. But it's, it's not today, guys. It's, so but who do we have in the wings still ready to work? We have architects and engineers already here. But if we have the architects and the engineers setting the standard for the proper way to inspect, the proper way to sign off and, and do all that, uh, and they want $1,000, and the firescape inspector, you know, three to five years from now is going to get, you know, 500 bucks, well, then that's just competition, you know. But what I'm telling you, there's already, a, there's already a group ready to inspect these fire escapes. They just haven't been invited to the dance for many, many years. But this documentation basically forces on all commercial over 35 cubic, thousand cubic, what happens? You have to use this document anyway. So this will help bring engineers back and, uh, and architects back into the oversight. Does this fire escape here, this is Fort Lee, New Jersey, does this fire escape pass? No? Next slide. The person that called me on this on this fire escape, uh, next slide. The person that called me on this was the secretary. She goes, I got a letter from an engineer, and he says you got to do four things. You got to fix a tread on the third floor, and you got to fix uh, a bent um, something else on the floor, and you got to paint it, and I'll sign off on it. We got there. We we condemned it. Our photographs show that the whole, the whole fire escape was just at the point of, con of being condemned. So. This is where, who's right, who's wrong? It's not really who's right. What's the method of inspection? What's the checklist of inspection? There is none. If everything is opinion for the past 75 years, the opinion is starting to get a lot of, a lot of abuse. Next slide. Here I am in Chicago. I got a letter that says, hey, fix a couple of small little items, and that's the letter. That's the entire exam. It says, fix a couple of little items. And so I, the reason I was there, I was just there to give it a price using the document. But I did my walkthrough. In my walkthrough, next photograph, I found all these bolts and the main rods holding the thing. Because this is a reverse rod the system, not, a, not the brackets underneath. It's these rods that come from the wall down, then bend down, and then you screw. That's what they all look, every single one looked like. I said, you've got a situation. You load these first things, these things are going to fall off. But yet I had an engine. The guy says, just follow the engineer's report. Do what the engineer says. So again, in Chicago, I gave the only class in Chicago to the fire department and the building department in a combined class. Are they? Do they have a? Do they have a uh, conference set there? Not yet. So a lot of times, just because it's a great idea, it's like one of the gentlemen says here: you're opening up a Pandora's box. So why do some of the situations they don't want to deal with it at this time? It's because it's a Pandora's box, and they got other things to deal with right now. Next, next photo. This is here in Worcester at a detention center for juveniles. When you walk up to it, it looks pretty good, right? Solid. You look underneath it, what do you got? Next. This is in an inner, inner courtyard. Next. This is at schools down in, uh, by the water, down in Jersey. We do a lot of the tri-state area. Uh, we do what's called a hammer test. That's not a low test. It's a hammer test. It's a safety test for our inspectors. And I'm sure every one of you, when you, go, when you guys walk on a fire escape, and you may never walk on a fire escape after today's class, because I'm going to give you visual cues that from the ground or looking out a window will tell you the condition of the fire escape. But we do a hammer test for this reason. Next slide. Next slide. 
Next slide. Three pound hammer. <laughs> Okay, next slide. I'm going to stay down here, that's right. So there's times we're walking on the parsley, we stop the inspection, we have enough evidence. Go ahead. Pardon me, sir. Has everyone signed in for this class? She's going out. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low text or other evidence of strength. I spot repair this farscape. What are you, what are you going to jam down my throat? Low test, why? Because you can, that's, that's correct. But at the same time, it's because you, you want an opinion or you want an assurance? Assurance. And as soon as I load test, am I, it, does my liability drop? Does the city's liability drop? Does the owner's liability drop? Because something can still happen on this fire escape, but did you do what the law said? Did you load test it? All right? Or did you do other evidence of strength? Because you only have two options on every fire escape. So if you spot repair anything, and I'm going to talk about welding right after this. Uh, if you spot repair anything, you gotta you gotta perform the low test. That's the that's the stinger on the end. Because what you're trying to really do with these fire escapes is force people into what? Refurbishment, which should have been done if you check the history of a bolt. You know it should have been done in the 25th to 50th birthday when you get a bridge and they rebuild a bridge and you got all those beautiful rivets. Why do they use a rivet buster? Replace the rivets, but they look good to me. Why are you guys replacing the rivets? What's the main reason why they replace the rivets? Because they're old. They can still be good, but they're old. And I need an assurance, not an opinion. And you get that either through x-ray or through, or through uh, load testing, right? So this is not a class of forced load testing. It's just to remind you that you, already, you had this trump card in your back pocket and you didn't even realize it. It's not the engineer or the architect that suggests a load test is that if he can't convince you that the proper work was done on that fire escape, what will you drop on the table? Load test. What will you take off the table if he gives you what? Other evidence of strength. What is other evidence of strength? I want every rivet on that taken out. Now while I'm here, I'm talking about, you've got a bunch of welds here. Welds that have no rust in the connection. What do you want on all the major structural that I have a welded connection? What's the only way to 